so my name is Julius Hanning. I'm from the University of uh, Erlang Nuremberg. And last year I did a three months internship with Wolfram, and today I'm uh, presenting a marketing example from that on iris recognition. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Julius Hanning. Um, I have done an internship at Wolfram last year. And today I want to talk a bit uh, about one of the results of that, and that was uh, a marketing example on iris recognition. And since January, I'm as a PhD student at the uh, University of Erlangen-Nürnberg with the Digital Sports Group, where I work on um, uh, human movement analysis uh, in a medical context. Um, but let's dive straight in. So um, the table of contents for today is of course, we'll look a bit of, at the motivation of why do iris recognition. Then I'll quickly explain the data set I use, and then go over the methods of how actually to do iris recognition. And then we have two identification schemes, one via the Hemming distance and one via a classification approach. Okay, so um, iris recognition has become surprisingly reliable in, for example, uh, security, um, settings or law enforcement settings, but also in the identification of paperless refugees. And the most striking example is maybe that of the Afghan girl um, on the left here, um, who ended up on the cover of National Geographic in the 80s and was actually identified by an iris scan in 2004. And Wolfram Technology now delivers all the building blocks to build up an, uh, an entire proof of concept iris recognition uh, system. And that is what we want to do today. And in doing so, we'll basically follow the paper down here. So John Dorkman, who is sort of the guru in iris recognition, wrote an invited paper titled How Iris Recognition Works. And um, that was the basis for, for this presentation, more or less. So in terms of data, um, I use the noisy visible wavelength um, image database, Uberis, that is provided by the University of Beira in Portugal and can be publicly uh, downloaded from the web. And it contains color images of the human eye. And in total, we have about 1,877 images from 241 participants. We have, um, for each participant, uh, four to five images uh, from two sessions. And one session was uh, done in a dark room to minimize the, the artifacts from reflections and change in contrast and luminosity and such things. So we have one, one data set that's really high quality and then we have another session in a more natural environment reflecting all the problems you have there, for example, uh, at the airport. And then we do some simplifications for this. So we only look at the first two images. We use the first one for, for training and the second one for testing. And we can um, load an image here from the database and it looks like this. And then the first thing we'll do is we'll resize it quite a bit to only 200 pixels um, because that makes computation easier for us in terms of time. And also in iris recognition, you probably want to have it work at a distance and then you do not have um, yeah, that, that high resolution that you find on this database. And the last thing we do is we only use a great channel. Okay, so much about the data. Let's look at the methods. So I put some of the code outside of the notebook and just load that here. Um, first, we'll have to segment the iris, so determine the boundaries of the iris and the pupil. Um, then I'll talk a bit about unfolding the iris pattern, which we have to do in order to um, yeah, get a commensurate support for all the irises because yeah, basically you have two, con yeah, two circles that don't share the same center and then you somehow have to compare the, the patterns and do that in a way that is consistent uh, over the irises. And then we compute what's called iris codes with the loch garber filters. And these loch garber filters is a prototype I did for, uh, for Wolfram last year. So I'll explain shortly what the loch garber filters are and how they relate to, to garber filters which some of you might know. Um, yeah, then we'll go through the iris codes actually and in the end do the batch processing on the entire data set to, um, to have the iris codes for every participant. Okay, so how do we get the, um, the boundaries of, of the pupil and the, and the iris from here? So basically what we'll do is we'll use a, a template that looks like this. 
and that captures the change in contrast from the sclera here to the iris and then also from the iris to the pupil. And the method we'll use is essentially a gradient descent on the response to this template um, where we then estimate uh, the, the center of, of this circular structure by the highest, uh, highest response and then also the, the radius by just the radius of this template that we can adjust. And then we can run such segmentation here. It takes a few seconds and then we can look at the result. And then you see, okay, the um, segmentation seems to work. We can also look at the, the progress of the segmentation. So if I press, press play here, then okay, first we, uh, we find the errors and then we, we zoom into the pupil. And um, so one thing to note here is that this is of course a very, um, you know, very straightforward technique to, to the segmentation of these these structures and it didn't work on all the images. So it only worked on 91 images from the training subset and on 70 from the testing subset. And I, because the project was not about segmentation of these, the iris and the pupil, I just select these data sets to, um, to work on them in, in the remainder of the talk. Um, okay, then uh, as I said earlier, now we have these two, um, two circles and need to basically compared to iris patterns. And what we do is we um, convert them to a dimensionless polar coordinate system. Um, and we can assemble some positions here and then show them on the image. So basically what we do is we sample eight points radially in between the two boundaries. And then angularly we have 128 samples. And then we can put it all in the function here. So we'll um, yeah, sample these positions here and then use image value and I really reshape to, um, to get the pattern out and then uh, plot that, for example, the array, array plot. And then we have such a pattern here from, from this iris. Um, and the iris code is now basically answering the question of condensing this pattern to a very compact form that we can easily compare. Um, and we do that with loch filters. They were first proposed by David J. Field in this uh, publication here. And already from the title, you can guess that the motivation was somehow related to statistics and natural images. Um, and in contrast to the Garber filter, so I have here on the top row the, the Loch Garber filter in the um, Fourier domain and in the spatial domain over here, and then the Garber filter here also in the Fourier domain and in the spatial domain. And the first thing to notice is that the Loch Garber filter is constructed with a logarithmic rescaling of the axis of spatial frequency. So that would be radial if you're not in the one dimensional case. And because of that, it's non-symmetric around its center frequency here. And that then um, makes the kernel more spatially localized, as you can see here. So the Loch Garber kernel is spatially a bit more localized than the Garber kernel. But most importantly, the Loch Garber kernel um, will be less sensitive in um, yeah, to, to changes in contrast because it does not pick, any D, pick up any DC components. So as we go to zero frequency here, the response drops down to zero, whereas in the Garber filter you still have something left. And that's particularly important for, for this iris recognition um, application where you don't want your features to be contrast dependent. So then if we go to the iris codes, um, we'll use these kind of filters in, in 1D along the angular direction of the pattern. And we'll have an even and an odd filter part uh, that we use for demodulation of the pattern. And then we'll encode the phase. Um, and the, the phase encoding scheme is shown here. So whenever the even part is positive, we'll get a 1 here. And whenever it's negative, we'll get a 0 here. And then for each pixel in this, um, in this iris patch, we get sort of one complex bit that is uh, just these, these two numbers here. And then we'll just um, rifle them together to get a code that is um, angularly twice as long as the iris pattern that we had before. We do that here in this function, so iris code. We throw in the iris pattern and some um, parameters for the filter, so basically the, the wavelength that corresponds to the center frequency and a bandwidth factor. And then the phase quantization is done with the unit step. 
So whenever it's positive, we get a one. Whenever it's negative, we get a zero. Um, and then in this, this table here, we compute the filter response for each row to have it angularly and also for the even and odd part. And then down here, we just drive it together the, the even and odd part of the filter. And then we can do that for an example here. And again, we see this, this iris pattern that we just had here, and then also this code, which is now a binary code. Um, and in that is, is quite effective if you want, for example, to compare two codes or also to store it or... So it's, um, it's a very compact descriptor of the pattern. So what's left now in the methods is the batch processing. Um, so there we'll just load in our data directory. And then I have here the selection for the training and tests that I manually selected, so the cases where the segmentation works. Then I can load the images, do the segmentations, with our, which I yeah, just saved in the CS4 file here because that actually took some time. Then we can quickly test if the segmentation worked. So for this uh, image it worked, and let's check another one. So for example, one, yeah, looks also fine. Um, then we do the unfolding, so we use this iris pattern function, and here we compute the, the iris codes. Okay, now we have the iris codes for the training and test data set and can play around a bit with that. Um, so the first identification scheme we want to look at is identification via the Hemming distance. And just as a reminder, what is the Hemming distance? Um, so Hemming distance gives the Hemming distance, not very descriptive. So maybe let's look at the details here. And here it says, okay, the Hemming distance gives the number of elements whose values disagree in U and V. So basically the number of, uh, of pixels where the two codes disagree. And with that we can already um, identify a person, but we need to have some sort of decision boundary to uh, say, okay, this distance uh, we can consider to uh, we can consider the code to be actually the one that we we have on the database, and if the distance is a bit larger, then we say okay, this is not the person we we are looking for. And to get this decision boundary, we look at imposters versus authentics on the database. Um, so in this training and test data set that we have, and we have to normalize for inconsistent um, iris orientations in the input image set. So we could either um, rotate the input images, but now as we have the codes, we could also just compare uh, cyclic angular shifts of the code, which is computationally much more efficient. Um, and what we'll do, we'll compare eight different orientations and then just keep the best fit for, so we basically rotate the pattern and keep the best, best fit over these eight rotations. And to enlarge the populations, we'll test the training set against the test set and vice versa. So here we have the the angular shift, so we want to shift eight times, so this is the amount that we have to shift. And then here, uh, we test the training against the test data set, keep the best fit over the cyclic shift, so with the min here over this table where we then compute the hemming distance for these two codes here. One is the code from the test set and the other one is a rotated version of a code from the training set. And the training set um, will just limit to the cases that uh, that is not the current uh, code that we put here. And then we basically do the same for, for training against test. So we can evaluate this, and then we do the same for, for the authentics, where we limit the, the code that we put here to be exactly the, the code from the training set that we uh, select here. So we do the same here, evaluate that, and then we can plot histograms for both. Um, and we have here the normalized Hamming distance, so from zero to one, uh, for the imposters and the authentics. And for the imposter, it looks quite good because we have a lot of iris comparisons. And the distribution is quite sharp. So we can say, okay, uh, if we draw our decision boundary somewhere here, then we are probably uh, quite good. On the authentic side, we're a bit short of, of iris comparisons, uh, so we have only 140. Um, but the general trend seems, uh, seems reasonable, so it's more likely to peak somewhere around 0.25 than this 0.46 here. And then we can yeah, actually look at the results for some um, 
decision boundaries. So we just sample decision boundaries here and count the number of, um, uh, of instances where, for example, the imposters are below or, or above this, uh, this decision boundary and also the authentics. And then we get, uh, for these Hemming distance criteria here, we get the false positives rates and the false negatives rates. Have to find some, uh, yeah, some good match between the two where we now actually want to draw this uh, decision boundary. As already said, we're a bit short on, on data, and Dogman reports results on a database of about 1 million iris codes, and he can maintain false match probabilities as low as 10 to the minus 6 with this approach. So it's actually quite powerful. Um, the second thing that we want to do is do the identification via classification. There we can basically do two things. We can either throw the iris codes directly into classify, or we can just use the raw images without any uh, feature extraction, because the iris code is basically a feature of, of the input image. And we'll first look at the iris codes. So we'll just um, compute classifiers for a set of methods here, um, and then look at the, at the detection rates and then just choose uh, the classifier with the best detection rate, which in this case is support vector machine. And then we can have a look at the results in detail. So um, we'll come up with this big table here where we have a recognized ID and a true ID. And whenever the two match, okay, I'll color it in green. But um, when they don't match, I um, color it in red and I show the segmentation for this ID and for this ID and also the codes. And the Hemming distance is here to the training set for all the test um, images and also where these two IDs are in, in this point, point cloud. So the true ID is somewhere here and the recognized ID is somewhere here. And here you can already see, okay, it's probably an issue with segmentation. Uh, I might have to discard this, uh, this image in the first place because the segmentation does not, uh, does not actually match. And then down here, we have a second case where, yeah, okay, it's probably the same issue. So the segmentation is not really good here. And the third case here, um, where, to be honest, I don't really know where the, uh, the mismatch comes from. One thing could be that, of course, in the segmentation, if you would uh, do it properly, you, of course, had to also mask away the eyelids here, because uh, those don't really belong to, to your iris pattern, and yeah, you, you would have to work more on the segmentation probably to make this work a bit better. But we can have a look at the detection rate again. So we're at 95% for this, and false match, uh, or false positive rate is, is only 4%, which is actually quite good. If you now only throw in the raw images, so without any processing, then we can uh, again do this for, for a bunch of, uh, of methods and look at the detection rates. Oops. And then we see that, okay, the best one is the nearest neighbors. Could have guessed that one. But the detection rate is um, only about 87%. So um, the, the extraction of this uh, very compact feature did make sense in, in the first place. And also if we think about scaling the whole thing to, um, to the scale that, that Dogman reports his results on, having these codes in this binary format is very efficient because you can uh, compare them very efficiently uh, as compared to if you would yeah, just train it on, on the input images. Okay, that'd be all for me. Thank you for your attention.